Here we are, second to last lecture of the course. Second to last lecture of the middle of the course. We're still in the middle of all this. We're not yet summing up. But we can already see a few patterns. We've already been making note of larger patterns throughout the course. Uh, and as we move back in time, these patterns uh, hopefully are becoming clearer and clearer that the more we go back, the more distant the evidence, the source of the evidence becomes, the more conjectural, the more uh, tentative, the more speculative, and the more susceptible our story becomes to the many, many layers of stories that have come since. And the clearest example so far that I keep referring to is in the Parthenon, where it is such an important feature of our identity, it's such an important building block of the identity of Western civilization, that it, uh, who doesn't have a shoe? I was number three. Did I put out number three? Here's some number twos. There's also some number three going on too. But in the, the Parthenon, we looked at how it is such a fundamental building block of identity of the so-called Western civilization that it's hard to tell what the original uh, society had in mind. What Pericles had in mind. And that just gets thicker and thicker. Uh, perhaps the most startling example is when we look at China a long, long, long time ago. The actual physical evidence is very skimpy. And what historians have said about the first moments of recorded history starts to dominate, starts to uh, create an influence that is so great it's almost impossible to separate what actually happened from what, uh, how we've interpreted over the thousands of years since the original events. And so this is one of the benefits um, of doing the course backwards, is because we understand the, the motivations of colonialism, we can start to be sensitized to how colonial powers might have manipulated the story of history. Once we become sensitive to the nation-building projects of Chinese governments over multiple dynasties, then the Republican period, then the Communist period, and now the Open Door Policy period, once we understand those moments of history that separate us from the story of Daryu thousands of years ago, we stand at least a fighting chance of evaluating the evidence and trying to make sense. We can at least ask intelligent questions, such as, why did this evidence result in this interpretation? And that's really at the heart of doing history. And I told you a few months ago, uh, I shared with you the ambition to break the model of embedded in the architecture of this room, where I am the sage on the stage, you are the empty vessels to be filled up with the information that I have to offer. But wait a minute, all this information is readily available um, using the computer in your pockets. So, Am I out of a job? This is really about my job security. I hate to be selfish. But I want to continue to be a viable and valued member of society. So I've got to figure out a new role for me. So this is not about you. This is about me. Okay? I want to figure out something I can do to be of use to you now that this information is ubiquitous. It's free. It's frictionless. So what can I do? Instead of being the source of information, or being, instead of just being the source of information, I'm trying to be your curator, and I'm trying to train you to be the curators of this information. So I hope 
that through the way the lectures are presented, the way you do the assignments, the way you do the term project, the structure of the quiz questions and the exam questions, all of this is a test to see how well I can. Before we test you, this is a big test of me. How well can I change my job description? How well can I shift from being a font of information or just a font of information to being more than that? To be, first of all, a curator, and second of all, to train you all to be curators of, uh, to be sensitive and critical uh, manipulators, critical consumers, I don't like the word consumer, but critical participants in this information saturated world that you have inherited. Um, and so that's one of the reasons we have, we almost have to do this backwards. Otherwise, how do you make sense of this? A canal that was built thousands of years ago uh, with buildings that were uh, designed and the, the uh, archetype of these buildings were designed also thousands of years ago. But here they are, brand spanking new, freshened up, covered with LED lights, ready for uh, consumption. Uh, so how do you make sense of this? If I didn't do the course backwards, I might be in the awkward position, and I hate this position, of saying, okay, let's look at Shang Dynasty architecture in this photograph. Now, what's wrong with that? Everything's wrong with that. How do you take a photograph of Shang Dynasty architecture? We're taking a photograph of a replica designed through layer upon layer upon layer of interpretation of what little tiny bits of evidence might still be available and lots of storytelling of what Shang Dynasty architecture looked like. So with that preamble, hopefully what we're able to do here is also to unpack some of the biases, the Western Euro Eurocentric biases of history, where instead of presenting the model of, urban of the urban transition that we talked about last time with Mesopotamia, we have agriculture and urban specialization and the necessity of exchange economies and boom, cities. End of story. That's the one story available. Well, this lecture is going to uh, pose uh, variations on that theme. Are the basic outlines, are there some similarities? Sure. But there is also some fundamental differences in how the urban transition is made. Um, some people call it the agricultural revolution. It's not so much a revolution as a artificial selection and evolution. Uh, some people call it the Neolithic revolution, and that just gets us further and further away from the actual evidence. It's not about stones, which is the word, or tools, stone tools. It's about the technologies uh, associated with agriculture that lead to specialization, which lead to uh, the necessity and the impetus for new forms of social organization. And from a sites and systems point of view, we look at sites, we look at the evidence for what they have to tell us about these social organizational systems, which hopefully will help us understand the variety of social organizational systems that we're exposed to every day, and hopefully they become visible to us in ways they would not otherwise be visible. And hopefully that empowers the ability to engage and participate more effectively in the uh, ongoing evolution of these social organizational systems, which um, are otherwise known as your careers. Um, so, let's do this. Uh, one other thing about this lecture is that we are doing something all of a sudden that is closer to the spirit of the textbook, where these four sites are very close in time period. So I'm favoring the time slice that is favored by Mark Yarzenbeck and Vikram Prakash in, their, in the textbook for the course. And at the expense of a thematic uh, organization. So let's see how that goes. So when you notice an extreme uh, difference between these four sites, that is in itself an indication 
of uh, something useful to note that a different at a single point of time across the planet, there are extremely different moments uh, of, of social organization. Um, what Mark Yarzenbeck calls the social package, where he identifies uh, the early origins uh, of architectural history, which is uh, we'll be talking about uh, in the next lecture. So before we get started, any questions? That was a lot. To lay on you. I'm trying to organize large themes that might help you make sense of the whole course as we prepare for the end. Okay. So again, I'm purposefully trying to disorient you as we uh, come back to our home base, get anchored, get grounded, get a firm stance because we have some traveling to do. So we zoom out Again, South America. Wouldn't it be crazy to ask, but well, wait a minute, keep going to the Andes. What's going on over here? What about the rest of the world? Wouldn't be a crazy question to ask. No time. Right now. So, so here we are going back to Peru. Almost the exact same location that we've been several times before. And this is a very familiar architectural formation. Uh, for those of us who were uh, here for the Chavanda Huanta lecture last Wednesday. Um, so you see the sunken circular plaza. You see this building uh, that uh, kind of manifests as a landscape. Uh, you can imagine the labyrinthine corridors inside this building. Uh, these stairways through these tunnels uh, and what's in there. It's very familiar from Chavanda Huanta. But I want you to make note of two very important things. This uh, happens a thousand years before Chavan Huanta. This is um, the site called Caral in the Supe Valley, which is another one of those river valleys uh, in the Andes Mountains on the Pacific coast, where we have this vertical archipelago of climatic zones and distinct specialization of one kind of food coming from the coast, another kind of animal protein coming from the highlands, and different agricultural zones as we move down in elevation, different parts of the rain, shadow, uh, drier near the coast, wetter uh, up higher where the Andes uh, dump, forces the clouds to dump its rain. Um, so very different climactic zones supporting di very different uh, biodiversity in a short span because of the geographic extremity. And so this is another thing we've been seeing the whole time throughout human history. Geography plays a huge role in some places that work and other places that don't work so well. Um, some would say, well, this is not a likely candidate because of the extremity of the mountains. Well, that is um, because we're not seeing it through the lens of biodiversity, which is the game changer. That is the key factor. Close proximity to biodiversity, we should forgive ourselves for being blind to that because we don't care how far away the source of our stuff is. Energy and water travel make it more or less free. Let's just call it free. It's so cheap, it doesn't even show up. Um, so, um, so what is going on here? It's interesting in that it, it joins characteristics of these two primordial types, the circular sunken plaza and the ceremonial pyramid. And we see that split later in history, um, and we'll be doing some comparison. Um, so here we see the familiar sunken ceremonial plaza. It indicates a certain um, uh, favoring of uh, collective group ceremonial processes. And so one of the things we're going to be looking at at many of these examples is what they imply in terms of the social hierarchy. <clears throat> so here's, um, in the first case, we see a remarkably egalitarian social hierarchy. At least that's how it has been interpreted thus far, <clears throat> based on, in part, by the evidence of the housing um, and so we should recognize this <clears throat> f 
from this configuration that we saw last time at Chavan de Huanta, the sunken circular plaza, <clears throat> the temple that manifests as part of the hillside, uh, and remember the Lansen Stele uh, in the labyrinth buried in that building. Wouldn't be shocking or surprising to find a similar labyrinth and stele inside of this temple. This is a very recent find. Uh, only in 2001 ha was it recognized as being so much older than every other site in the Americas. This is the single oldest site in the, in the Americas. Uh, and so that's why it pops to the top and becomes something uh, worthy of looking at. So now let's also look at the pyramid uh, monument, uh, which is part of a complex of pyramids, which we didn't get a chance to look at um, uh, this previously, but it, uh, Teotihuacan in Mexico, I'm sorry it's not labeled with Teotihuacan, because this is one of those sites that got lost to the snow day. You see a very similar squarish ziggurat pyramid uh, complex with a pyramid to the sun. We're standing right now, we're on the pyramid of the moon, and we're looking down the avenue of the dead. And this is a, a key ceremonial site to the north of Mexica, which is now called Mexico City. Uh, and so here you see two very distinct type, typologies of ceremonial uh, sites in the Americas that come together in this earlier site, which should pose some questions. Is there sufficient exchange between the Andean mountain region and Central America to have permitted, over the course of a couple thousand years, uh, this kind of transfer of cultural, um, cultural artifact, cultural formation? Uh, does the architecture transfer? Evidence is thin, but isn't that an, uh, an interesting question to ask? And so going back to the Andes, we're back at 2600 BCE. Um, uh, the signs of human settlement actually are much, are much earlier, 5000 BCE. And then even earlier, as we'll look at in the next lecture, somewhere between uh, 12 and 20,000 years ago, is when the first humans came across the Bering Strait. Uh, and they make it down here um, 10,000 years earlier than this, uh, at the very latest. And so over the course of those 10,000 years, uh, they have a chance to develop and grow to the point where what we're looking at, it, it's really difficult uh, for us because what we're looking at seems to be so messy, so primitive. I don't see the signs of civilization here. But wait, it's, it gets interesting. It turns out this is the, one of the single most densely populated uh, sites on the planet, uh, not just at this point, but for thousands of years afterwards. This is a very highly concentrated population on this very small footprint. And they have a very sophisticated way of building that we haven't seen until we get to uh, the 20th century. And we referred to this previously, the tensile, the use of tensile structures. Uh, I'm a huge fan of this as someone who likes to sleep in a hammock. Uh, tensile structures rock. And literally here, they take woven uh, fibers, plant fibers, they fill it with rocks, and they carry it down the hillside. And then they don't empty the bag. They place the bags with the rocks into the monument. So this is a tensile reinforced compressive masonry, you could argue, structure. Where do we see that? Well, we see it in steel reinforced concrete. Uh, we, well, really invented in that combination, invented in the 19th century with the rediscovery of the recipe for uh, uh, calcium carbonate based cementaceous mortars. And so uh, thousands of years prior to uh, ferro cement, ferro concrete, uh, which is a fancy pants word for steel reinforced uh, concrete, we see this combination of tensile structure and compressive structure. 
Uh, it's a very fashionable thing to do, and you can see it in the landscaping between the Status Center and the Skidmore Owings and Merrill Wing, which I can't remember what it's called. But that landscaping design uses riprap uh, in the stainless steel wire cage, the tensile structure, uh, to contain the rock. And it turns out it's a very effective structural strategy to combine compre high compressive strength with very high tensile strength. So a little bit of emphasis on the absolute sophistication of what we see here from an engineering point of view. Um, the use of a stele. Uh, wouldn't be surprising to see a Lansing stone type stele inside that. Uh, we see this at another uh, Mesoamerican pre-Columbian site in the Americas that we would have gotten to look at. Uh, on Lake Titicaca, the Tiwanaku uh, cultures that uh, moved from this area and became the Inca. Um, we see some similarities with that. Um, so here we see the complex uh, in view, oriented to the mountains. Um, the interest, one of the interesting things here is the question of corn. Where's the corn? Uh, some say, well, we haven't found corn. We're willing to uh, conclude that there is no corn. Uh, they <coughs> ate other things. Well, what were all the fields around here in these river valleys? Turns out they were growing cotton. Food was not an issue. They had plenty of food because of this territorial network of exchange, like similar to what we've seen elsewhere. What they grew was cotton. And what did they use the cotton for? Well, uh, it's a little reassuring uh, to those of us who want to see how they got their food. Uh, follow the food is one of the themes. If you're doing history now, it's follow the money. If you're doing history a few thousand years ago, it's follow the gods. And back here, we're always interested in following the food. Uh, follow the corn is actually the name of the lecture that Patrick Hoy has proposed for our Mesoamericans lecture. And I like that. So if from a follow the food point of view, where's the food? They don't care. They've got plenty of food. They're going to follow the cotton. So they create this cotton-based economy of exchange. They're, they're growing cotton that nobody else can grow. And so in this way, it's a lot like Mesopotamia, except Mesopotamia was growing grains uh, in abundance that other people couldn't, and they are exchanging it for metals and large trees that they didn't have because of that marshy, Iraqi uh, coastline that has since filled in. So this is a cotton-based, intensely irrigated, very high-density um, society that some uh, have applied the very awkward term corporate labor platforms. Do they mean corporation? No. Corporate is a fancy pants word for a uh, group. It's basically that. There's a whole field of analysis that is uh, under the title of corporatism. How do groups operate? It's confusing for those of us who think corporations are this one thing that we know about. So this is corporate labor platforms. Huge labor supply because of the very high density. And the platforms is not a reference to the architecture. Uh, these pyramids that are also called platforms, that are also really buildings. The, the corporate labor platform refers to a social organizational type. So don't be thrown by that. Um, do they have deities? Do they have gods? Well, kind of. They have these cute little figurines. And here's the one thing that we see uh, carved into the stone. There's a conspicuous absence of stone carving, painting, decorative work, uh, ceramics, uh, and we have these crude clay figures uh, and this, these flutes and this one stone carving. So uh, anthropologists have interpreted this as being a very non-hierarchical, it's, it's not a priest god based society. It's a society based on cooperative arrangements. And um, that's an interesting conclusion that we're willing to float because it allows us to populate our history with a couple of examples that challenge the presumption that if you want to get anything done, you need a tyrant. If you want a society to advance, Andrew Marr, the uh, the author of uh, History of the World, 
um, one of the more recent attempts to capture this larger story in a single book. He's very cavalier and comfortable with the idea that war is hell, sure, but boy, it works. And it has given us so much progress. I don't buy it. You don't have to spend a fortune to put a man on the moon to get Tang. You don't have to go to war to get nuclear power. You could just get nuclear power. But this is one of those questions of history and contemporary issues that continues to make this dialogue interesting. Questions about, ah, the kipu, back to the hallway between building fill in the blank and building fill in the blank. I don't know these numbers. I know it's even. It's on the even numbered side of the film. 16 and? Well, it's closer than that. It's I think it's building two, or no, six. Yeah, on the fourth floor. So check it out. Again, uh, an alternative mode. It's not writing. It's not clay tablets. It's not like Mesopotamia. It's not tensile structure. Once again, go tensile. You can do it. Any questions about that? Let's go back to that. This one? Yeah, I think it's like XP gray, but it's like MC gray. I'm assuming that the line on the left is the water. Um, no, that's the ocean. Yeah, that's the coastline. This is looking at the relationship between two very old sites, the Cosmo River Valley and the Supe River Valley. And uh, some believe, there's some evidence that this network, this exchange network, extended through the use of wheeled carts, I think, no, not wheeled, llamas, uh, to this river valley, you know, along the, along the shoreline. So that's one of Mark's illustrations. I just didn't crop it to focus us on the one example. Okay. Other questions? Yes. Looking at the picture of the hood, hood of the fence. Um, yeah. It kind of reminds me of the table base, I don't know, behind like the Christian kind of icons. Uh, How do you know it's a hood? I don't see the pants. They told me. <laughs> so I'm breaking the rules. You got me. Foul, yellow flag on the play. I don't see the fangs either. And hood, I think people calling it a fang thing or being influenced by Chavin and Huantar, or maybe they're able to go there and look at it in a different angle of light and see things. I'm assuming that. But the other thing is you go on the internet, and uh, this is one of those whack, wacky things about history, and you see all kinds of theories that they see this guy, they show this picture, then they show a similar picture in uh, Egypt, which is well known, by the way, and they see, so check out what happens. Keep this image in your head. Take a look at Egypt. And by the way, step pyramids, they're everywhere. It's so obvious that we're visited by aliens. It's so obvious. So, so that's another thing way into history that some people love is it's so obvious we were visited by aliens. Why are people in denial? Uh, Area 51, et cetera. Right? And so that's... This is evidence for that as well. One of the interesting off-ramps of history. And it is an off-ramp. Other questions? As we fly over the ocean, across Africa, Persian Gulf, the Nile River Valley. Look at that. What is weird about this picture? Oh, we've been here, Aswan Dam. Where's that monument? There it is, thank you. Right there, that monument to Soviet era cooperation. Oh, where are we going now? Are oh, we going south, down the flooded area? What was flooded? Oh, yeah, the UNESCO project to save Abu Simbel. And where are we going next? Can we just freeze it there? Okay, thank you. Um, so, this is a talk about geography. Oh my God. Look at that. It's a highway of free water based transportation. It is one of the most fertile, uh, abundant 
uh, sources of agricultural production in the world, in the universe, because we don't know of any of the planets that have anything like this. And um, it's good for golf courses too. Uh, but Egypt, the story we're going to see here in Egypt, I've come to the conclusion looking into this topic, and I am interested in what you think. Egypt is like no other place, in part because <clears throat> it lasted for so long. It lasted for thousands of years, 3,000 years, arguably, of extremely stable social organization. Sure, there were wars, there were dynastic transitions, there was upper Egypt and lower, upper Nile, lower Nile, uh, new kingdom, old kingdom stuff going on that you studied. Um, sorry we're not to get into all of that uh, in this course, but you've studied that in high school, I, I assume, or elsewhere. You can read that on the internet. Not our problem. Your problem. Um, but we're going to look at these pyramids. We're going to look at this pyramid. As much as we can, we're going to look at this biggest pyramid ever, and where the evidence uh, of how it operates is not available, we're going to look at some of the other pyramids uh, as a system. And so here we have the Pyramid of Khufu, um, and we're looking at <coughs> how this pyramid tells us stuff about this society. So let's just walk through the process. Um, you're the pharaoh. And you want to have a good afterlife. You've had a good life. You've really enjoyed it. Wouldn't it be great if it could continue? Well, fortunately, the religion of the Egyptians holds that it does continue. And you need to prepare in this life for a really great party, everlasting party in the afterlife. And so it's, it's not automatic. You've got to do everything right. So um, you... Put, uh, you instruct your people. First of all, you set up an endowment so that in perpetuity there is funding and there is a huge labor force to uh, support this rich afterlife of your spirit embodied in a, in a spirit statue. So first of all, mummify, please mummify my body, float it on a barge down the Nile, or in this case a canal built off of the Nile, and then uh, bring lots of stuff with you on those barges and bring it up into the valley temple. Uh, and I'm either already mummified or you continue or, or do the mummification in the valley temple here. So the valley temple is the first stop. And then once I've been mummified, uh, please open my mouth so that all this fun food that you're going to be offering my spirit forever... Uh, I can consume it, and I can talk, and I can breathe, and all that in my afterlife. Now, uh, in a grand procession, take me up this causeway and up to the mortuary temple. Um, so here is my uh, Ka statue uh, on the barge. Uh, you're taking me up to the valley temple. Thank you very much. And from the valley temple, take me up this causeway to the mortuary temple up here. <clears throat> now, in both cases... Um, the thing is about the Ka spirit, my spirit after death, my soul, is I pass through solid. I don't pass through corridors anymore. That's when I was alive. I pass through solid stuff. And so both the Valley Temple and the Mortuary Temple have this really interesting solid void relationship. Uh, like the pyramids themselves, there's very little interior space. It's almost totally uh, solid. It's the heaviest man-made structure, I'm going to say, in the universe, because uh, I'm pretty sure there's nothing else other than the Earth that's man-made. Um, and so you see a little bit of that solid void relationship here. Um, but the, the, both of these temples uh, and then the pyramid itself are mainly solid. And that's important because my spirit passes through solidity. I don't pass through voids, as I did when I was a human. Now, uh, take me up to a hidden secret entrance, because I hate it when grave robbers come and take away my body and everything that I'm supposed to, and disrupt my afterlife. And so, a super secret entrance that is totally camouflaged. No one could ever find it. Except you've given the largest flag, saying, 
dig here. This is where there's a lot of gold, right? The pyramid, and later, and later uh, pharaohs uh, had secret hidden burials because of that problem. And so you have, um, so you have this very small shaft. Some of them are one meter by one meter square, going deep into the facade. And once everything's set up in there, they would be sealed up with stone. And it's slightly off center. It's not symmetric. It's raised up on the facade. So you have to really know where that entrance is to get back in. Um, and you're not supposed to ever go back in. But grave robbers uh, are persistent. Um, and so this is uh, how this works um, spatially. And so you go down uh, into the chamber. And here's our friend Sir Bannister Fletcher. Um, giving us a very effective graphic. Um, you go down, this is a subterranean chamber that's rough hewn stone. Uh, there's speculation that it's kind of a cult center because um, it's so different from the very uh, polished work of the other chambers. Um, you go down and you go up and you enter what is the Grand Gallery. And the Grand Gallery is suddenly this 10 meter high a ceiling after you've squeezed through this tiny little shaft. Uh, and then you uh, go up, the body is taken up to the king's chamber. And in the king's chamber, you have all of these uh, attics and these relieving uh, arches to try to prevent the collapse. Should the pyramid uh, ever have a problem, you're trying to maintain that cavity in there. And then you have all the ways you can seal it up once it's in there. And you have a stone sarcophagus that is so massive. It's carved out of a single piece of stone. It's so massive that you have to carve it and put it there as you build. And then you have to build the temple around it. There's no way to get that stone sarcophagus out, at least in one piece. Um, and so here's the, uh, a, a different pyramid, but the only photograph we have of this corbelled grand gallery zone heading to the king's chamber, um, the pharaoh's chamber. And so we have this arrangement. We have this thing called the Queen's Chamber, which is not the Queen's Chamber. Uh, it's actually the place where you put the, the primary Ka statue. This is the statue that is the, uh, the, the container of the soul, uh, the Ka of the Pharaoh. Um, and so the offerings that are brought to uh, the mortuary temple on a daily basis are consumed uh, across this distance because the Ka statue is traveling through the solid zone of the rock. Um, and we have a view of the, the burial chamber. Um, we're back to this. Uh, the, these air shafts are also to let a little bit of light in because although my Ka spirit travels through solid stone, it also, when it ascends heaven, it walks up lays, uh, rays of light as if it's a staircase. So I can pass, the, as a Ka spirit, I can pass through solid stone. I can also walk up the rays of sunlight um, streaming down from the heavens. Because I am the son of the sun god, Ra. Uh, I also uh, appreciate it uh, that you've put the the barges of my funerary procession that literally brought me to my final resting place, they are placed in a, a series of chapels such that I can now use them to follow my father, Ra, the sun god, on his daily journey across the sky from east to west. And then at nighttime, when he's returning back over to the east, I also use those barges uh, to accompany him on that journey as well. And so uh, all of these things have this very big function. Here's a Ka statue uh, from the MFA. Would have been um, Khufu's uh, Ka statue would have been uh, said to have been a solid green stone um, in one piece that it was lost. Here are the offerings. That's a leg of um, something being daily prepared uh, as an offering to the Ka spirit in the mortuary temple. Um, and here's a door within a door within a door. Also, there's the development of hieroglyphs that continues our theme of writing as part of this. Uh, this is all legible because of uh, 
the decipherment that we've been able to do. Um, this is a door within a door within a door uh, that is a passageway of the Ka spirit through the solid uh, body of the pyramid and the other architecture of this complex. And here you see it in place in a mastaba, which is a simpler uh, burial um, temple. So um, these uh, pyramids were faced with a, a very precisely fit white limestone to um, sit on top of the coarser fit uh, red limestone. And it would have been so seamless because of the precision that it would have glistened in the sun like a mirror. Uh, it also, um, engineers have studied it with lasers and they discovered a uh, astounding degree of precision that blows everyone's minds. They cannot figure out how they made this so precise in terms of the north-south orientation and in terms of the dimensions. It's like a, a, a tolerance uh, that is stunning that they did this probably with water levels and water-based measurement devices, uh, but even line of sight, it's, uh, it's astounding. Um, so here's a sense of how the stone fit. Most of it was pilfered uh, for other constructions in Cairo. You see the skeuomorph uh, of the tensile structures of tents, which is what pharaohs lived in when they were alive, uh, and what the workforce and what the people of Egypt, they would have lived in very simple, perishable structures. Um, they would uh, bundle together reeds and use them as structural elements uh, for their uh, houses, for their homes. Uh, in fancier, more expensive structures, larger structures, those reeds would be replicated in wood as the first layer of skeuomorphism. And then when you get to the scale of the gods in the afterlife, you need to scale up. And so it goes from bundled reeds to wood columns that look like bundled reeds to stone columns that look like bundled reeds. Um, and similarly, you see these tensile forms uh, rendered in stone uh, as part of this whole strategy. And so different pharaohs built uh, different uh, burial complexes. Um, here you see uh, the one that exists, uh, Khufu's son, um, builds this one. Um, Kafra, sorry about that spelling error. It's not Kara, it's Kafra. Kafra, there's an F missing. Um, and we don't have the valley and mortuary temples for Khufu's uh, pyramid, so we've been looking for inspiration from these and projecting them onto Khufu. Um, the, um, now, what does this tell us? about Egypt as a social system. First of all, it tells us that they had an astounding surplus of labor. The Nile River was such a productive uh, machine. Uh, unlike the Euphrates, or the Indus River that we're going to be looking at, unlike either of those, we have these period periodic flooding like clockwork. Every summer it floods, leaves uh, a fertile layer of deposits, uh, and it supports a huge population. They had as much as a 300% food surplus capacity um, based on this annual flooding. Uh, it wouldn't just flood, but it would flood in a way where the water would be captured away from the Nile and uh, slowly uh, seep in, into the, the water table. and create this vast bread basket in the middle, hemmed in by these two cliffs, which was a great source of stone, uh, different types of col and colors of stone from these cliffs. And up above those cliffs, desert, nothing. And so it's this freakishly uh, distinct landscape. And one of the things it did is it kept out uh, invaders. There was nobody coming from east and west. There was no one coming, well, uh, the, the people from the south, the Nubians, were the, the ones in charge for most of the 3,000 years. And then at the very end, 
we saw with Alexandria, Alexander the Great conquered, and they were dominated by the Mediterranean peoples of the lower Nile uh, in Alexandria. Um, but despite those minor things, it was very conservative, very stable, in part because it was such an effective uh, machine uh, for producing um, uh, food surpluses. And it, uh, that all of that food surplus, it was almost like a public works project where they uh, put people to work to keep them busy building these things that really have no purpose. Uh, this death cult produced a lot of demand for labor, but didn't really help us. It's kind of like, again, to take liberties with this historical social uh, forces, it's kind of like the military industrial complex. Um, our economy operates uh, not just on goods and services, we also measure, and it uh, counts just as much, the bads and disservices. So uh, we're neutral. Our economy measures things neutrally. It doesn't matter if it's a tool of destruction or a tool of production. A dollar is a dollar, and it counts the same. This is similar. It doesn't help anyone, but it moves, it moves the economy and keeps people busy. And so some people have said, well, why? how is it that Egypt had such an extraordinary long life uh, it was such a powerful, stable uh, society to the point where uh, you can look at a temple uh, built uh, in 300 BC and uh, across, across a short span of space, you see something built 2,000 years earlier. And it's hard to tell the difference. It really looks the same. It's very stable aesthetically. Uh, it's very stable as a social order. But it has left very little impact. Uh, sure, uh, there have been cults, like there's no Hinduism, there's no Buddhism, there's no Christianity. There are a few cults that come up now and then, but we don't really get the same, uh, we don't really get the same impact that we see with other societies. Egypt is an extremely important place, in part because they have a high population and they're part of the Arabic world, not because the cult of Horus or Ra has any significance, any uh, special significance to large numbers of people today. Um, epilogue, Abu Simbel, just to check in, this was produced uh, in the New Kingdom, which uh, I'm taking liberties to not talk about. We're just focusing on this, again, this one anchor point to help us make sense of the rest. So any questions about Egypt? Big topic. Sorry, we're rushing through it. But ask questions. <clears throat> what about the theory that the Egyptian culture is the basis for the rest of the classical world? Well, it's certainly. Um, thank you, because one of the things, and is there a slide? Yeah, there's a slide. Um, this was not rehearsed. Um, it turns out that this isn't exactly right. Um, the Mesopotamian societies were in contact with Egypt. There was a continuous connection across what used to be called Canaan, what is now called Israel, Palestine, Lebanon, Jordan. All of these uh, areas were interconnected. There was a sharing of writing. There was uh, certainly the stepped pyramid idea didn't make it to Meso, doesn't explain Mesoamerica. I'm going to hang on to the possibility of Martians. Um, but it does explain step pyramids in Egypt and in Mesopotamia. So there is a very strong evidence that uh, there was uh, extensive interchange and mutual influence across this short path because there was exchange. Also, we're going to be looking soon at the exchanges between these areas as well. We've already talked about this, um, but I think there's some maps that show. No, there's not. Other questions? OK, zooming back out. We're looking at the area that that map just covered, where we have Mesopotamia here. And we have this river valley, the Indus River Valley, 
uh, present-day Pakistan um, and India. Um, and we're focusing in on this site, Mohenjo Daro. Mohenjo Daro uh, is also a, a superstar of recent acclaim, of recent discovery, relatively recent discovery. It was the 60s and 70s where excavations started to uncover the importance of Mohenjo Daro. And again, this is another uh, challenge to our generalization of these first urban civilizations. Mohenjo Daro does not give us evidence of uh, a king or a, a god cult or a priestess uh, or priestly class. Um, we see instead something that's very uh, egalitarian. It's almost Chinese, which is the last site we're going to be looking at. And it's, uh, it's veneration of professionalism, of urban amenities for everyone. And the urban amenity, of course, is water. Uh, keeping with this theme of water cities and the importance of water uh, across history. Um, and so the star of the show is the drain. Who would have thought? So the, the bricks are of an absolute precision, absolute uniformity. The brick becomes the module upon which everything else is based. And the most important things that brick construct in Mohenjo-Daro and the larger Indus Valley civilization are water works. Um, we're, uh, we're looking at the drain because this is the thing that is ubiquitous. It's everywhere. And there are different ways of making drains. Some of the drains are large enough for a human to walk through. Um, but mostly, they're quite ingenious. Um, we think we're so cool with our pipes, and now our PEX flexible pipes. Uh, but this is pretty cool. All they needed was bricks. Um, no going out to the truck and saying, sorry, I don't have it. Uh, i got to order it and go to Home Depot to get it. It'll be a week. Uh, no, it's all brick all the time, and people are, are maintaining it themselves. And it, it implies, a very, again, a very strict social organization in order to maintain uh, the order that is implied in this. Um, we don't see anything like these drains until we get to Rome. Rome has... We saw a cross-section through a Roman street that was drained, and we were so impressed. This is uh, 2,000 years before Rome. This is 4,000 years ago, more or less. And in this area, which is now Pakistan, which makes it difficult and dangerous for our friends to go here, um, they had plumbing. 4,000 years ago, that is better than a lot of the plumbing in the towns and villages uh, currently in the area. So uh, go figure. The, um, this slide, I'm supposed to say that um, the water of the Indus River would, uh, would come in spurts. And when I, mean sp when I say spurt, I mean flash flooding. In the, the, it's draining from the Himalayas. Uh, ice jams, uh, landslides can block the water flow for, uh, for weeks uh, where it builds up until it finally bursts through. Coming down having catastrophic impacts, the city of Harappa, just to the north, uh, was flooded and destroyed seven times. Uh, and each time they rebuilt it. Uh, well, maybe the last time. It's not there now, so maybe they, it flooded eight times. Um, and the walls that were built around the city were not for defensive purposes. They were primarily built as levees to channel the water away from this um, hilltop town, the upper town. There was an upper town and a lower town. Um, here's a typical street with uh, the drainage trench off to the right. Um, there were extensive districts of courtyard housing. Um, we see something here that we call a stupa. We think it was built many, many thousand years later in the Buddhist uh, time um, uh, after Ashoka sent out his people. Um, Buddhism came to this area. But we're not looking at that. We're looking at this. 
Uh, we're looking at the great bath, the granary, and right now we're looking at the housing district. This was in the, uh, a neighborhood uh, for elites. But wait a minute, elites, you said it was very egalitarian. Well, it was egalitarian, but it was not without its social stratification. But it was an interesting social stratification. There were some blocks that had small houses, some blocks that had medium houses, and some blocks that had larger houses. And that was it. Uh, so you lived uh, in a neighborhood of houses of a certain size, but there was no palace, and there was no, uh, you know, there was no extreme stratification of social hierarchy. Um, here's an artist's uh, depiction, what they think uh, it might have looked like, uh, featuring in the foreground um, these water channels bringing clean water in and soiled water out, uh, wells, wells in many different houses uh, throughout the housing neighborhood, um, and baths and toilets. They had flushable toilets, and they had baths in their houses. And this is a reconstruction of some of the masonry uh, and the form of those constructions. And this is how we imagine uh, it may have worked. Uh, in the, the baths and the, and the toilet over here, that's what that means. And the, the soiled water comes out through this drain and is drained away. And so you had a, basically a sewer system. And here's um, what we know more of, which is those drainage patterns that are embedded in the ground. And what we see is a remarkably pre-planned arrangement. The scale, the module of the brick is directly related to the the modular arrangement of houses, which is directly related to the modular arrangement of blocks, which is divided in a four-quarter pattern. So it's very geometrically ordered, uh, which implies a very strong social organization uh, holding it all together. The, the houses would have uh, had its entries on the smallest alleys uh, that they access. Um, the title of this site is Great Bath of Mohenjo-Daro, uh, and I'd like, and it's misspelled again, I'm sorry about that. Uh, I'd like to be able to say uh, these priests and uh, describe the religion and the rites by which they, uh, they deified the gods, but no one knows. It was not the YMCA, it was not a lap pool, uh, but something happened in uh, relation to purification uh, the veneration of water. The Vedic rituals that we looked at with Varanasi came much later. Um, uh, so some people think it might have been a pre-Vedic water uh, veneration. Who knows? Um, one of these questions that we're not sure about. The complex around the pool um, looks like a great place for a party. Um, we think that there were uh, covered structures of wood um, to give shade and shelter, but the pool would have been uh, uncovered. And next to uh, the bath complex here, there is this building, which is identified as a, a granary. I'm not sure if it's pronounced granary or granary. I've heard it both ways. Um, but this is an extensive complex where food surpluses would have been stored. Did it have a ceremonial function? Some people believe there were uh, meetings held here. Uh, some people uh, they have found bones in the corridors, and so there's a belief that some people were buried in the hallways uh, between the granaries. Um, these triangular structures are for ventilation um, here, and we have a few visualizations uh, of um, grain being brought from the fields around, irrigated fields, production of grain. Uh, and here we see, again, something we've been seeing all semester, a uh, canal, a boat, uh, the load, the transfer of goods uh, by boat and by cart to the granary uh, and lift it up um, for storage in the granary. And so you have no fortress, but you have the canal harbor warehouse town uh, configuration. Um, you have some very sophisticated artwork. Um, we love this guy. Um, and so what can we, what can that tell us about uh, the larger story? Um, 
of the Indus Valley? Well, they had uh, over 1,500 sites. I'm talking about Mahendra exclusively so far. But over 1,500 sites, and there's Mahendra have been identified uh, throughout this Indus River Valley. Um, there was a second river, the, the uh, Saraswati, but it dried up. And every town along the Saraswati River was abandoned early on. Uh, here we see the, the, um, the precedent, uh, mainly of Magar, Margar, up here. And it's thought that around uh, 2600, they moved from here down into the Indus River Valley and very quickly developed um, and established this Indus River culture um, with all of these settlements throughout. And they had, we found, um, a lot of the things that they produced in Mohenjo-daro, uh, some of the things that clearly come from these, this region, are found uh, in Mesopotamia, indicating an extensive trade uh, relationship uh, between uh, the Indus River Valley and Mesopotamia. And so you get this filling in, remember we saw this map, uh, these key uh, organizational societies of China, uh, northern India and the Indus River Valley, Mesopotamia, including Egypt. And then we have the filling in over the, the uh, centuries of these zones uh, very quickly between Indus and uh, Mesopotamia. Questions about the Indus River Valley civilization? Yes? So it seems like the city was really small up to the Yes, quite should small. We, should we conclude that they limited their population? Their population was uh, a middling um, um, four digit number. So it was measured in the thousands. So when we get later in time, like Egypt, three million. Plus, that's for the entire Nile River, which was like a single city. It was like um, the eastern seaboard around uh, Interstate 95. Some people refer to it as a megalopolis because if you could only go, if you could only survive uh, 12 minutes uh, without going to a McDonald's, you'd be fine. From, one, from Atlanta, Georgia, all the way up to uh, Bangor, Maine. Uh, and so the Nile was like that. It was really one urban system. Mahendra Dara, uh, and so that's the three million population of this long linear city. Mahendra Dara, each of these little dots uh, was measured in the thousands. Uh, and Mohenjo Dara itself was one of the four large ones. Um, it may have been in the middle to high range of several thousand people, you know, thousands of people approaching 10,000. Uh, but as a network, the 1,500 different towns who have close uh, connections and trade relationships uh, it would have been um, not even close to Egypt, but um, would have been five, six digits, would have been six digits each. Other questions? Did they limit their population? That we don't know. Uh, we see no signs of violent death. We see no um, sacrifice. We don't see bloodshed. We don't see violence, warfare. Um, why did they abandon these towns? Probably they just moved on uh, with cl climate change. One river dried up entirely. The Indus River uh, was not as stable. And um, so we don't know why they abandoned the Indus River Valley. Uh, it's our swap to be more. It just dried up. But it's probably climate change related. But uh, population control was not a big issue. There wasn't a huge, it was more the opposite. Like, how do you have enough people? Because uh, that's one of the features of agricultural societies that resulted in that spike that we looked at a few weeks ago at the beginning of the semester. That is an agriculturally motivated population spike. Uh, the more children you have, the better off you are, unlike today of college costs. Other questions? Okay. Quick stop in China. We are, um, this is the latest moment uh, that we're visiting. Uh, we're zooming up um, practically yesterday. 
um, to the Shia dynasty of 2205. Uh, there's Xi'an. We've been here before. We like to go to Xi'an a lot. Here's where we were last week. Uh, the first emperor, Shi Huangdi's burial tomb. And not far away, just down the Yellow River, uh, this is where uh, Yu the Great, Da Yu, um, hung out. And sorry, not much real evidence, but right here, underneath this canal, well, the, first of all, there's an amazing thing happening here. What's going on here? What is that? I'm pretty sure no one here has ever seen anything like this. What is that? It's an underground canal. And what is it going under? It's going under a river. There is a ridge line here. But there's a river. There's the, the Yellow River, and it's a natural course. And these wacky engineers say, I don't care. You need a canal? We're doing. There are, uh, if you, there's also in China, there's a canal bridge. I think there's one in France as well. Well, in the Netherlands. Well, Netherlands. It's like Mars. They're the exception to the rule. It's wacky. But yeah, canal bridges. They ride bicycles. They don't even drive cars so much. And trains. I don't understand this. Yeah, this is contemporary. Yeah, this is contemporary. But right near here, this is where you, not you, da, I'm going to say Da Yu. I don't mean you. So Da Yu hung out and worked here. Now, here's an example of history where I love the Dutch. The Dutch, if, if I had my way, this course would be all Dutch all the time. It's hard not to mention the Dutch. Whenever we talk about flooding and water and what it takes to do social organization, the Dutch rock. Um, but I kind of missed the chance because that moment in history passed by us so fast. Um, but next version, lots of Dutch. Um, so uh, Da Yu is important because, not because he was, um, you know, stands out uh, at the time, but because of everything that happened since. Dayu is the uh, quintessential bureaucrat. He was not, he didn't inherit uh, through blood lineage, although he was of royal descent, they say. What we know of him comes to us through a series of chronicles. And fortunately, this historian uh, mentioned in the sheet, Sima Quian, Sima Chian. Sima Chian. Fortunately, Sima Chian used footnotes. He used citations. He wrote the records of the grand historian, he and his father, uh, probably the same name. Um, they wrote the, the records of the grand historian, uh, one of the most complete histories. Many times larger than Thucydides' uh, history of the Greek uh, world. Um, and he left footnotes referring to the annals of the five emperors that came before him. Um, so good historical practice that allows us to say, here's where the stories came from. But these stories include things like you the great, Dayu, uh, had this magic sword that could cut through mountains. Um, they tell stories of um, the yellow dragon and the black turtle that helped him build these tremendous canal systems. Um, and I've mentioned it previously that as great as the Great Walls are to China, the canal system is so much more important. The canal system, the Grand Canal, is like the Mediterranean Sea because it connects all these different exchange economies together and make them possible. So this is where Da Yu, before he was the first emperor of the Xia dynasty, am I saying that right? X-I-A? Xia. Xia. The first emperor of the Xia dynasty 
uh, it wasn't an emperor, but the first king of the Shah dynasty um, was a canal builder. He was a humble engineer. His father was an engineer, uh, and uh, things didn't go well for him. King Yao said, hey, Gun, um, you've got to control the flooding. And so Gun tried to hold back the waters, like the Dutch did for a long, long, long time. Hold back the waters. Uh, and we talked about how all you need is for one link in the chain to break, and everybody's flooded out. So the importance of social organization. So Gun had this secret weapon. He had expansive clays. Expansive clays, when they get wet, like canvas, it expands and it seals. Magic. Very powerful. But he was trying to fight the water. When his defensive uh, levees failed, the king sliced him up into tiny little slices and spread his body all over the landscape. And then turned to his son, you, and said, okay, you do it. And you didn't do anything for a while. He walked around, he talked to a lot of people, he listened. Uh, he was a good bureaucrat. He listened to the people, he thought about it, he observed nature, and he came up with this idea <clears throat> to not fight the water, to divert the water. It's kind of a, a jujitsu move. When a wall of water is coming at you, you step out of the way and you guide it past you. And so this is what the Dutch do now, since we're talking about the Dutch. Uh, they allow certain areas to flood and protect the inhabited zones. Uh, and that's something that we wish the US would figure out uh, sooner rather than later. Um, but it worked. Uh, the other thing he did is he lived and worked with the people digging. Uh, he uh, left home, and uh, a few months after leaving home, his canal digging activities uh, brought him past his home village, and he heard the sound of his wife in labor. But he didn't go in. He kept working. He kept his head down, he kept working. Then when his son was old enough to talk, he, he went past his village again, and he heard his son calling out to him. And he didn't even, he didn't stop. He didn't, he just walked right by and kept at work. And then when his son was 10 years old, uh, again, he just kept going. So this story, was it true? Who knows? I'm going to assume it's not true. But what is important, it doesn't matter whether it's true or not, it was an important story to be told in the history of China. What does this story do? So... Suddenly, we were talking, we've been talking about, um, well, first of all, what does the story do? Yu is one of the three sage kings that Confucius tells us is the model of uh, appropriate behavior in society. Confucianism, as this cultural core of the social organization of China through, for many thousands of years, uses the story of Yu and his dedication to his craft, to his uh, engineering, to proper uh, behaviors, uh, he becomes a very effective um, part of the story of how to be a proper government official. Uh, and so in the context of uh, these earlier periods prior to the establishment, prior to um, Dai Yu's establishment of the Xia dynasty, uh, you have the, the annals records 10,000 kingdoms. And these, um, so in the Chinese context, chaos. 10,000 kingdoms, chaos. Uh, not good. So Yu is one of the great heroes bringing order uh, to the kingdom, to uh, taking on the mantle, uh, the obligation to the mandate of heaven to be uh, a proper administrator uh, that leads to the cycle of renewal of the different dynasties, uh, but far more stable than other societies we've seen in history. He builds these few short segments of canals, especially this one, uh, the Longman segment of canal, which is very close to that, that, uh, that canal tunnel that we were looking at, very close to Xi'an. Uh, which is now called Chang'an, and probably Xi'an, 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 thank you. 
Um, and so now we have one of the most important, one of the places that I wish we had time to look at is Suzhou, Suzhou, China, because of the gardens, because of the cultural importance and significance to the Chinese uh, history that Suzhou plays. Uh, also, uh, in terms of this message of proper relationships, the humble gardener um, the, it is a very important figure in all of this history. Um, the ideal order of the nine square grid uh, with the, um, the royal realm at the center, this is believed to be one of the models. Um, didn't show it when we, I don't think I showed it uh, in the context of the Forbidden City or uh, the, the um, Daming Palace in Qian, uh, because those, those two sites don't really follow this example. Uh, and it's important not to be too sloppy about that. But we don't know what Erlitu, the capital established by Da Yu, looks like. But the de literary descriptions do follow this. And so I saved this diagram for this special moment uh, in the course, because finally, it might possibly fit. Um, there's ancestor worship. There's carts. There's the subsequent dynasties uh, that expand. Uh, there is a great wall here that um, then silk, one segment of the Silk Route. Um, and so this gives you a sense of what happens after the establishment of the Xia Dynasty. Some people say the Xia Dynasty didn't really happen. Uh, that it was part of the Shang Dynasty uh, storytelling to help justify and establish the Shang Dynasty, which gives us the Zhou Dynasty, uh, and then the Qin Dynasty that we talked about last time. Um, but what it left us with is the Grand Canal. This is the Mediterranean Sea of China. It allows close to free exchange in terms of energy. Uh, remember the physics of water transport. And it establishes the key network of uh, the great urban centers of uh, China throughout history. And at each one of these intersections, uh, we get the bonus connection of these river systems, um, which is something we keep coming back to. Um, the Great Wall is great, but the canals are greater, which is the final. Uh, and we can look at what it looks like today and how important it remains um, to the moment. Questions about this or any of those topics?